All right, everybody, welcome to Cyber Bulls. So this time around, we have some big powerhouse bulls with us. We have Alexandra, we have Jeff Lutz, and we have in James from Invest Answers. The big topic today is going to be about RoboTaxi. You're going to be shown a lot of new information about RoboTaxi's valuation. And we're going to debate a little bit of what kind of design we think that RoboTaxi will have. In 12 days, we're going to have the Tesla earnings call that's going to happen. And of course, we've heard that Elon's going to be visiting India. So these are the main topics, but we'll never know where this conversation is going to go. Let's start with you, James. You have done a show on RoboTaxi valuation. How has your thinking changed about RoboTaxi in the last uh, several days? Well, coincidentally, I just got the latest FSD on my X. As you know, the X's and the S's were delayed until I think last night there was the big rollout to those vehicles. And I, t I was very busy all day, but I did take it for a hard test drive through some of the most challenging roads where I am. And I went in with extremely high expectations and I was blown away. This stuff is extremely real. And I can't, I, it's hard for me to fathom why or how the price of Tesla is where it is today, first of all. And second of all, how nobody in the traditional finance world appreciates it or understands the moment we are living through. This is a once in a lifetime, maybe once in the history of mankind event mm. that we have just lived through. It is ginormous and nobody sees it. Unless it's those people that actually have these cars that do it. Like where can you buy a car for $35,000 or 40,000 or depending on your tax credit or tax situation and have it drive you. It's like a 24 seven personal chauffeur for next to no money. And it is absolutely mind blowing. So I just want to start off with that. And this goes way beyond just robo taxis, it goes self-driving cars, robots, autonomy, AI. It is a bonkers time to be alive. Thank you for that, James. Like, so before we get to your valuation model, then let's ask the panel, what do you guys think is going to be, how quickly do you think that uh, FSD is going to improve and what will they, where will they be by August 8th? Do you think that they would have it feature complete? And what does that mean? That means that there's reverse, it can recognize emergency vehicles, it can do summon and it could be, you know, self itself to banish to park itself. And is there other features that you think it will need to be, or does it not even need to be complete by August 8th? It's just a presentation. Let's start with you, Alexandra. What do you think? Um, I expect August 8th to be mainly a business case presentation. We may have already a prototype of a futuristic robo taxi, but it, no, it really doesn't matter to me whether that car is there or not. For me, it is much more confirmation of uh, Autonomy Day 2018. I, I did put that clip in my feed um, over the weekend. So people, if you want to see that eight minute clip where um, Elon presented the business case then, uh, explaining that any Tesla owner who wants to integrate the fleet can make $30,000 a year um, running his Tesla as a, as a robo taxi. Uh, and I think that just needs updating. And, I, and, and that's the major part I'm looking forward to. I, I, I really expect to have the financial business plan aspects into it. Now, will it be ready by then? Uh, it will have certainly improved. I mean, iterations are now going, you know, in such huge steps and so quickly. So will it have all the five elements you, you just mentioned? Could be, could be, could be not. I mean, that, that that's it. But by then we have in North America, at least, I don't know, 1.5, 2 million cars that are ready to be deployed if they want to be deployed and they, they will announce a date when this will become doable there may be an app that is then downloadable um so i think that that's much more the the aspect that is important that people understand the financials of it and then what will follow and actually in 2018 elon addressed that already what will follow by tesla for all the areas that are not covered by Tesla owners wanting to run their Teslas as, as robo taxis. So that's then the next car. And, uh, you know, we, we may get later into design aspects of it, but that is where the scalability will really hit home and where I hope, you know, Wall Street will finally understand what this is all about. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I think uh, there's your question 
I think there's two kinds of feature complete going on. There's this FSD feature complete as a kind of a level two vehicle with the reverse and smart summon. And I think that's going to happen here pretty quickly. It looks like they can rapidly integrate features and, and rapidly test and rapidly deploy now to the fleet. Uh, it looks like it's a pretty stable platform. Uh, and given how the, the, the training looks like it's accelerated, um, I think a really important note, I think you have a great agenda for today, Herbert. I think a really important note is Elon wanted to make it very clear that he's number two, at least for now, uh, and growing in terms of, of, of bringing on compute and uh, XAI can be number three. And uh, I think that's really important in, in terms of how Tesla is positioned and how his companies are positioned as AI companies. I don't know how FinTech and the financial media could even avoid having this conversation. Is this an AI company or not when they're buying more AI compute? And now they're actually putting it to use and, and, and putting it to real world use. Remember, you know, the output of language models and the in the kind of the utilization rate of these language models versus well, I think we're going to see what the utilization rate of FSD and reaching a billion miles and then kind of hitting that hockey stick inflection point. I think they're going to be two fundamentally different different things in terms of its usefulness. I think the ability uh, to move throughout the real world, whether it's on a vehicle or in a robot, uh, is going to prove to be a lot more meaningful. Not that you don't need both in terms of language models and movement, but I think this is going to prove to be a lot more useful and meaningful. In, in terms of uh, aid, uh, in terms of the uh, event, I think um, they definitely want to be able to demonstrate the the basic features of a robo taxi. Will it be feature complete? It's hard to say, um, but I don't know if it needs to be fully feature complete. But be able to do the basic demo of you know being able to you know drive itself up onto stage and potentially do a pickup, uh, whether it's on video or it's live. Uh, and be able to do kind of everything, the full, you know, app and functionality. I think that would be uh, very relevant to say, all right, they really thought this through. They've got, you know, they've got it running at some level. And now they just need to really honestly debug this and and scale it out. So I think it's pretty exciting uh, in terms of what this could be. Um, so. You guys think that there's a chance that um, they don't offer RoboTaxi for the current owners. Is that a zero chance? Because I know, Alexander, you just said, look what the, he wrote in eight years ago. <laughs> Is it still valid? Well, it's six years ago, five and a half years ago, but it, uh, no, of course, they will, they will let Tesla owners integrate. There's, for me, there's zero chance that uh, it will be only a Tesla owned dedicated network. I'm I'm certain they will let. I mean, that was always the business case for for robo taxis, at least part of the business case. The the question obviously is how much, how many owners will adopt that. I, I've spoken to a couple of owners who said, you know, I love my ex, but I'm not going to put it on the the street. I I don't want to share that. I mean, um, will current Uber and Lyft drivers change? Will they think, you know, will they say, okay, I'd rather have now a Tesla and when I'm not, when I'm not having it? Because the one thing you have to understand, I think there is one issue we have not covered yet, is there are cities that currently need licenses for Uber drivers to um, to drive. So I think it's called a TLC license or something like that. I may be, I may be wrong on that. Um, so what happens when, um, the car drives by itself. Who needs a license or not? For example, New York. New York has in, in, in nearly all the agglomeration of New York City, uh, you need you need this license in order to be either a cab driver or uh, an Uber driver. So there there are stuff to it where you know it may be difficult for a current Tesla owner who is willing to do it to actually set it up. And it may be easier for for Tesla itself having a master license for all their own fleet. But other than that, I, I'm, I cannot imagine Tesla preventing any Tesla owner to be part of the network. Okay. A show of hands, who here thinks that Tesla is going to partner with a rideshare company like an Uber, Lyft, or something like that? What for? Exactly. <laughs> so you're just like, no? no. Well, you, James? I was like, no? There's no point. No, no. Mm -hmm. Why? Whatever you, Jeff? Um, the yeah. only thing I could see potentially is for customer data. Uh, both on, um, you know, both on the 
rideshare side and, and maybe the food or goods side, but that could be for a limited period of time. It could be to kind of test Tesla's usefulness. Uh, I don't know if they need to. Um, yeah, I don't know if they they have to. The other thing I would watch with RoboTaxi is as FSD improves, I, I'm wondering what happens to the used car market for threes and whys. And, and and watch that market. The the search data is already saying that that search that it's ramping up, and just watch that. If those things start getting vacuumed up pretty quickly, that could be very telling. I agree. Exactly. Yeah. And I'd like to circle back on some of the stuff that was said by both Alexandra and Jeff. First of all, uh, all the other AGI applications they are truly LMs, and Elon said this is baby AGI. It's a real world application. Nothing else like that exists out there. And the fact that Tesla is not even considered an AI play is comical. And it's great. It's a gift to us because we get to stack at a cheap price. Second, regarding Jeff, what you said about RoboTaxi, could they do a demo driving today? I imagine myself, I said, take me to the gym, click. All that needs to be done is two things. One, turn off the nag and have the passenger be sit in the back seat or whatever. It goes to the gym. It parks right up at the front door. And then, then it just needs to learn how to drive off and park itself or go to the next destination. I mean, they, they've done the hard part. So closing the loop on the robotaxi, I think it's already there. And the third thing that I think is very important to consider, Elon Musk has been burnt in the past. He's been over exuberant about some of his dime lines. I think right now he's much more conservative. He doesn't make the statement mistake twice. So he's no longer the two week Elon guy instead. I think you picked 8.8 for an exact reason, and they will be ready. I could be wrong, but they are my thoughts. You're that? right on pointing out the date. You're right on pointing out. That date is just so iconic. Um, who has booked their flights? <laughs> <laughs> no, but who who actually agrees that uh, eight? He, he, had, he did not just say it's going to be 8.8, and then now the team is scrambling. Oh, no. This has been in the making for a while. I mean... Uh, that Reuters story was incorrect, but it wasn't baseless, right? I mean, they, they heard stuff and they obviously exaggerated and pulled it on the wrong side of things, but there was stuff in there uh, that is not wrong. So the deprioritization of the Model 2 to now really um, put the pedal to the metal for the, for the robo-taxi date, that decision was taken a couple of weeks, short months prior to last week. So this is not just, you know, this was not just uh, announced and made up by Reuters. And then suddenly Elon had to react and said, OK, let's do this uh, on, on a, uh, August 8th. No, 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 no. Reuters got some wind on some on some issues, blew the whole story up and, you know, ran with the headline cancellation of whatever Model 2, because they knew that could be seen as the most harmful thing by some Wall Street whisperers. And uh, and so that's where they wanted to carry the story. But that doesn't mean they they didn't have some of the information that was correct. And especially the ones on conversation with suppliers that were, you know, timeline sensitive. Jeff can explain that much better than me. That had to be delayed. And I mean, so you have to give these people reasons why it's going to be delayed. And uh, and so that had and and there was part of that that was uh, that was certainly truthful and that dated from January February not from April. Yeah, gotcha. I, I agree with I agree with that as well. So I do know that Elon and Tesla like to mess around with Wall Street and media, so they probably threw them a few breadcrumbs, knowing they get confused and run down a dead end. First of all, and second of all, it's pretty clear that. If you think about building a Model 2 when BYD has a $10,000 Model 0 0.5, whatever you want to call it, that already exists. That's not a special thing to develop. But what is, is the robotaxi. So I agree as well wholeheartedly with Alexander that they are pivoting their resources to ramp robotaxi. That is the sense of urgency I see right now. When did they release the first time 12.1? Because, I mean, I, I recall very well, it was second half of August when Elon did in his S, the drive around, you know, with the first neural net version. And then I think the first 12.1 came out probably January or whatever, right? I, I mean, yeah. yeah. So between that and the moment of the leaked 
conversations with suppliers, that's very short weeks. That's really short. So there they got convinced we got this and yeah. we're turning the switch. Because up to that moment, up to that moment, it was probably in peril. They said, okay, fair enough. As long as we don't have major breakthrough in FSD, we're going we're gonna to continue working on the compact car. Again, unboxing and the compact car will come. This is not about, this is not canceled, but this is a much more competitive segment where, you know, there will be some Chinese cars. There may even be eventually some European cars that are competitive in that segment. That doesn't mean Tesla is not doing it. There's a huge market and they can gain it. But what makes them truly different is FSD. And that's where they have to take the time advantage. I mean, there are some Chinese people working on uh, on the Chinese FSD. I'm not saying they are even halfway there. Herbert, you got a great chart on that. But uh, but but it is the most distinguishing mode they have. And so once they came to the confidence level that we got it, we can do that, well, there was Elon. Remember what he said to Lars when he said to them, okay, you got 180 days to develop the Cybertruck like this and like that. And 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 uh, and Lars explained that they started chatting on how they wanted to do it. And Elon came back and said, now it's 90. I don't want you chatting. I want you doing. And I think that's exactly what happened with August 8th. He just put the line in the sand and everybody is now, okay, here we can concentrate on it. And that's it. Yeah. And the very first FSD test of version 12, that demo was August 26th. So it's not 8.8, eight, but close, close enough. So it'll be less than a year from that Agreed. official demo. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, James, let's get started with your valuation. You did a whole show on this. You've got some slides to show us. Let's talk about the valuation of RoboTaxi. And then from there, we can talk about the potential impact of the stock. And then we'll have fun uh, debating each other, I think, on, on okay. what we think the RoboTaxi design is going to be. It's funny, I was flicking through my old uh, valuation models. My very first one was in 2020. So it's hard to believe it's four years later and we're still looking at RoboTaxi valuations model. But for the first time ever, we're actually close, super close. So I have a base model, a super basic model here, which I'd actually like your input on. And then I have a more complex one that I went through actually with you, Herbert and Cern Basher and Hans and others. So continually refining and tweaking, but this, this is what I call the back of the napkin, super simple one to think about. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we go back to the number of these things, Elon said in 2019, you know, 1 million. So he, one thing about Elon Musk, he's very good at picking numbers way into the future, mm -hmm. like five years, yeah. or eight years. So when he said 1 million, that was his kind of line in the sand. Yes, that's easily achievable. Now, the question is, how much can one of these make a day? We know it's possible. I talked about the scenario, just turn off the nag and have it park itself or go somewhere else to the next call. It's there. The hard stuff is done. The question is, how much can these things make? And how much do they need to undercut the competition? Like taxis, like taxis are ridiculously expensive. Um, Ubers, it depends on where you are and the time of the day. But could it run for 12, 16, 18 hours a day? The answer is yes. It, I would have to probably charge over one of those conductive mats, which I know exists too. That was a strategic acquisition made by Tesla. And then what is the business model? Do Tesla make 15% or 50% or 25%? So I'm thinking one of these puppies could easily make $300 a day. Uh, I've spoken to many Uber drivers in my years, and I always ask them about their business and... I remember uh, being in the back of one leaving SFO airport, this Russian guy, he was probably 25 years of age, but he had calculated everything for the last 18 months of Uber driving down to the penny per day, cost of insurance, the car, tires, oil, service, uh, gasoline, everything else. It was incredible. And he said, I remember this distinctly, about 40% of his cost is the gasoline, which is a big part of it. Anyway, the question is, we know the TCO of an EV is much cheaper. How much could these things make a day? How much do they need to charge per mile? Is it a dollar? Is it 50 cents? Is it 75 cents? So over to you all, where would you land here with how much, if you imagine they are real, I do, how much they could make a day and how much would Tesla take? Some people are talking about 50% profit share, which is easily achievable. Yeah, I almost think you need to look at it. <clears throat> and first off, thanks for, you know, you for putting something out there. It, it's almost like you need to look at uh, a launch view 
uh, of, you know, this goes out and the competition are uh, cars being driven by mostly humans. That That's mostly the taxi network in the world. And then there's these limited cities that already that have robo taxis, you know, by, you know, Waymo or other companies. But it's very, very limited in terms of, um, see, I guess you have to look at kind of the existing market and understand where it's at at launch. And then as you blanket the world with a, a volume of vehicles, what that does in terms of the market, in terms of what, you know, what the willingness to pay is, you know, what would the market bear per mile? Uh, driven. So it's almost like there's kind of a launch view and a lifetime view. Um, and, and you kind of have to keep looking at it. Maybe that's your different views at 1 million versus 3 million, but it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's almost like when it launches, it's going to be, cause there's going to, there's, there's not going to be anything really like it. And this is what people, I, I just, I don't think it gets discussed enough, uh, of the, um, the the cost of a Tesla robo taxi vehicle versus the cost of a a fully loaded you know competitive robo taxi vehicle are two very different things, and we don't even understand the useful life of of, of what uh, of of them yet. I mean, there's there's some information out there, but um, it, it's not like they 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 don't have issues, they don't have problems, they don't need to go in for repair. But I was just saying, in general, I think there's going to be uh, a pretty healthy kind of profit in the beginning and then it needs we need to look at like what does the market bear what will the market bear per mile but even if it gets down to something very small uh per mile uh it's it's going to be wildly more you know profitable than you know the auto business itself um so it'll be interesting to see where it'll be interesting to see what it does to um the sale of of, of the, the global SAR of vehicles as well you know, we hit a peak in 2017, and I just don't know if this dynamic has been studied enough of, of how many vehicles will be per- as as this happens. What does this do to purchase patterns of vehicles? Does it change uh, meaningfully um, or not? I think it's another thing to study. Yeah, and I, I've seen a lot of interesting cases where you you could have a family with say two or three teenagers. They buy a car for each teenager, literally. And you got the front of the house is littered with vehicles. It's like a parking lot. It's insane. But the cost per a fifth of a mile in New York City is $2.50. And that's going up as wages go up, as gasoline goes up, as insurance goes up. Uh, I've got some data on that where the inflation on those items has been out of control. And they continue to go up, which is another tailwind for these things as well. And I agree with what you say, Jeff, about opening up the market and also disrupting the market and exposing the market to new market segments that could never afford cabs in the past. Could be somebody on, you know, very limited income. And they were never able to get a taxi before. But all of a sudden, if this is less than a buck a mile, they could take it to go to the store for the first time or something. So that's that's also very interesting. And then regarding the longevity of these vehicles, we do know of Tesla vehicles that have a million miles on them, same yeah. battery. So that's also yeah. crazy. Yeah. There's one more dynamic too, which is what can Tesla vertically integrate with their services that is usually disaggregated and, and where there's a margin structure in between, for example, insurance. Uh, and, and you talked about your, your Uber driver example and what they pay for insurance. And that's been going through the roof. We see, we've seen the CPI data that came out this week. And the fact that, you know, Tesla offers this service and they don't just offer the service, you know, they have all the vehicle data, they have, the performance data they understand you know how well it performs and what that ins- what like what the should be cost is of insurance and 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 what to actually underwrite it as I, I just i don't know if people have grasped how powerful that is but when you start tearing down these these margin structures in between uh various businesses it's basically vertically integrating and when you start tearing those down what you do is you take the cost of the consumer way down. You sorry, you take the price to the consumer way down. You take the cost to the aggregator way down, and you have something there that's very special that would be very difficult for others to copy. That's what a lot of people don't talk about. Oh, somebody else will do a robo taxi, and or someone's doing that today. But then you actually start <laughs> digging into the details. Well, do they have insurance service? Well, do they, you know, what's the cost of the vehicle? And and just 
you know, are they teleoperated? Like there's all these details that come out and like, oh, well, it looks like they're building their Tesla. Tesla doesn't do anything unless they're doing it at scale. Everything okay. is intended to scale massively. And I, I, if as long as you understand that, I think that's one of the, the, the biggest takeaways. To, everything they're doing here is to met the scale. I agree with that. And then add the charging. Nobody else has the charging, yeah. right? So, so uh, and certainly not at Tesla-owned rates. So that's one. And I was just thinking, can you imagine in a couple of years, you go to the airport and instead of having all these Ubers and, and cabs waiting there in lines for hours and hours until they cab, uh, pick up, they're, they're outsmarted because while they sit in their car, nothing is happening. While the Robotex is the same way now as with the charging stations, they can anticipate traffic, right? They know when to be there and when to be in the line to have the next uh, client. They'll be so much smarter in calculating when is the good moment to arrive at that airport to find customers to bring them somewhere and then to go back to the airport if that's your, you know, your main location, then the human cab driver driven cars that are just sitting there for hours without any knowledge and without any you know infrastructure around them so th th this is going to disrupt this whole market forever obviously the the cab market but also the normal car market i mean i'm i'm, I'm always looking on my ex because i love looking out of my office window see my car gives me gives me warmth but it will give me even more warmth if it's driving around making me money i mean this is just going to be fantastic yeah there's another aspect as well that some people haven't spoken about is humans like to sometimes be alone, especially if you've got to work in this vehicle. You do not want to be chatting with a cab driver or sharing it with somebody else. You want And especially women, James, especially women. I did a I did a, a, a poll a couple of days on that question. And I mean, fair enough, my 112,000 followers are mainly Tesla interested people, so they know what we're talking about. But I encouraged everybody to share it with their own crowd. 14 and a half times more women want to be in a robot taxi than in a in a, a driver driven car it's just it just gives that woman the, the the security and privacy and 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 good feeling rather than being in a car with somebody they don't know yep exactly. when we look back at your um evaluation model again so this is your base model correct this this, this, is, uh, this is this is like uh <laughs> the neanderthal model yeah so yeah. you know you just okay pick how many there are, say, uh, my asked in the, in the valuation model I went through with Sir and Basher, who friend of your yep. channel, of course, very well. Uh, we estimated in 2025, there could be as many as 700,000 of these, because remember, you're just turning on activation and Tesla will be scaling and ramping their own vehicles too, which will be dedicated robot taxis, but you've got the ability for private vehicles to become robot taxis too. And I know people that aren't selling their old Model 3 because they want to activate that as a robo-taxi. They buy the new Model Y for themselves and they're that's keeping me. their old vehicle. Well, that's mm -hmm. you too. Okay, <laughs> there you mm -hmm. go. Yeah. Um, so calculate how many there will be at whatever year and then how much do they make per day? And then of that, what share does Tesla make? I have a super conservative 15% here, but I know it's going to be more like 5-0%. And that changes the game completely. Do the math. Divide by the number of shares, earnings per share, and the, at a P of 60, because this thing is going to grow like crazy. This is going to grow double every year for eight or 10 years into the future, pretty easily, I'd imagine, especially as they open up other markets around the world. And uh, think of think of all the benefits as well. I know ARC talked about GDP growth. Think about pollution, congestion relief, parking structure, freeing them up. I mean, the... <sighs> The benefits are infinite and therefore the return is infinite for these things. I think it's pretty stunning. So super conservative and you can push this out any time into the future. You could be talking 2028, 2030, well, 2032. Let's stick with ARK Invest. Are bonkers. Yeah. yeah. ARK Invest, they say $2,000 uh, by 2027. In your model, it'd be 3 million. Cars would need to get there at 25% revenue share. What do you guys think? Is it likely that there'll be a 3 million cars uh, by 2027 that are robo-taxi ready? Worldwide? 
I mean, the, no, the thing it's is, it's got to be U.S. only. It's got to be U.S. only. It's unlikely that you're going to get robot taxi. Oh, no, no. Well, that, by that's China, China, that's China like definitely it. will launch. Exactly. Other countries that want to change, want to be more productive. Like uh, all I read right now is reports out of Europe of how they know they are struggling. Uh, Martina from the IMF came out today. Europe, we have a problem. We need to increase productivity real bad in a real hurry, and we can't issue any more debt, which is code for robots and things that accelerate GDP growth in my little brain. Uh, so, I, I mean, the world needs this. And the world, I think we're going into a stage where countries will realize they need to turn on value adds wherever they can get them. And this is all roads will lead to Tesla for this, I believe, in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, Herbert, you've called this out. You've called this out before that um, there will be cities that pull and when they're successful, it, it will actually drive other cities to pull and you'll have it. You'll have this domino effect where right now the, the world is offside or the people, most people are off sides and they think that this is just going to be a massive regulatory barrier everywhere you go. And if it works and it's done well, um, you'll see other cities, you know, trying to pull and copy like we saw with New York and, and, and you'll see them actually become, you know, more aggressive with it. Yeah. And I, I would like to have a first go on which three cities I think will start. And I think okay. it's going to be Miami, Austin and, and Vegas. Yes. Um, um, just because, you know, all three are very Elon friendly. Um, all three have already legislation in place. We, we discussed that last Friday, Herbert. I just want to recall that again. In the U.S. at the moment, there are only 10 states that have really regulations on, on uh, robotaxis. All the other 40 either have nothing, and that means it's allowed for training and, and usage pur purposes until a new, new law may come up. And there are a good dozen that have explicitly allowed them. And those that have explicitly allowed them are Arizona, Nevada, so it may be Phoenix as well, but anyway. So um, Nevada, Arizona, Texas, and Florida, and and I think those are, and it's also obviously easy climate change uh, states where where you know weather conditions are going to be stable all through the twelve months, and uh, I mean apart from some Florida hurricanes and and some rain in 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 uh, in Austin, but it's not the big snow that they know up in the north. So uh, that's my best guess. So in terms of revenue per day, what could one of these things make? If you assume a fifth of a mile in New York City is $2.50, let's start with the dollar. Would you believe it would be less than a dollar a mile? More? I think they want to be very competitive, right? Uh, to make mm -hmm. sure that the adoption starts really as a bang. What, what were you about to say, Herbert? Sorry. Well, I just remember, again, if we're going to go back to what Elon said years ago, he said it should be the price of a bus. Which is, I don't know what that is, two bucks to go five miles? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I've ever been on a bus. Um, yeah, I, I, let me try to see if I can find that out. But I, I'd imagine buses are also probably more expensive now than they used to be in the past. And CERN also spoke about the disruption to traditional public transport. Yeah, it's, oh, for it's sure. Dr like, like you look at what, what I refer to as Covidians did to rail and light rail transport in places like San Francisco and BART to Oakland, ghost town. Those trains are running empty. They were so bad that they had to actually cancel a huge amount of lines that were running. And again, it goes back to people having privacy and security and not sharing the air with other people. That, that has a value as well that is not intangible. And safety for children. I mean, how many parents lose so much time in, you know, chauffeuring around their children? Um, if that can all be safely done, that's going to be a, a yeah. big change. Oh, my God. Okay, what's going to... Mm -hmm. That robot taxi is going to kill soccer moms. <laughs> <laughs> Do the, better. the soccer moms will still be there and cheer up their kids. <laughs> so this is your valuation model, right? You're saying two thousand dollars share per share if you get a, a P of sixty and all these kind of metrics, three million cars, back of the napkin. And if, so, do you guys if, agree? If you, if, you, if, you, yeah. if, you, if you take an important thing to remember here, if Tesla get a fifty percent market share, you just need one point five million of these. 
Okay, that's but even one point five million. That's only for the whole company. It doesn't include their energy storage business or robots right. or anything else. It's tiny. Okay, but see, the one point five million, right? So I know that Jeff, you said just a bit earlier. So I'm going to push back a little bit. You said it's all about scale. But some people are going, but you don't need to scale robo taxi right away. You just need a hundred thousand robo taxis in the city of Chicago, right? That was what James Dama calculated, how many Ubers was needed there, and you can cover Chicago, hundred thousand. All those cities you just mentioned, Alexander, you don't need a hundred thousand per city. So you don't you No, but the United States, States is big. The United States is big, no, it's I, bigger. But, but uh, you're gonna go city by city. You don't sure. need that many. So by twenty twenty seven, are you guys still thinking there's gonna be three million? Uh, worldwide, robo taxis. I don't know. Do I'm, I'm really that? not sure. I have to think through the three million number. But the 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 one thing I'm certain, and it's actually funny because I got a lot of of objections when I when I spoke about that. I think this will shrink the whole car market. Yeah, yeah I yeah. think that somebody that currently has two or three cars at home will only need one because people mm -hmm. usually want to have you know their own car for when they travel or whatever. Um, but everything else, errands, every you know moment where. Two people want to use a car for different things will be covered by will be covered by by robot taxis. And so for me, the car market shrinks. It's really funny because I hear a lot of people saying, no, 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 the car market is actually expanding because there will be robot taxis and everything else on top of it. I, I can't see that. No. Yeah, I don't see that either. There is a, a tiny counter argument, and that is the cheaper the vehicle, the more you open up the market again per arc so the boid seagull or whatever it's called at ten thousand dollars that exposes a lot of people that wouldn't otherwise be in the car market so there is that possibility but again nobody wants the cost of insurance as well which could be a big problem in the future unless of course tesla right providing the insurance so this it could cut both ways initially okay so walk me through it guys so in terms of since i have the big hitters here <clears throat> what you guys think is going to happen to the stock price August 8th, they come out and they say, we've got RoboTaxi. It's amazing. It works. I've got the whole program. We're going to launch three cities, Austin, Miami, and uh, Vegas. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. We're going to launch it next year. Santa Barbara. Nothing happens, at a... <laughs> Santa... nothing happens to the stock, right? I think all of us agree. August 8th, nothing's going to happen. And then they launch it the year later. When will you Why see Why a year later? Stock? Uh, okay, you tell me. Are you actually expecting on August 8th that they're going to launch it within a month or two? I expect it to be launched by the end of the year, yes. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Why not? Why not? In I mean, in, in states where there's Tesla insurance, because that's the thing. I think if you want you, your own Tesla to be in there, it has to be a Tesla insured car. Um, that means they're moving from level two to level five then yeah i expect that to happen by by the okay, end so, of this year all right i it's not going to happen with you my car is not going to become a robo taxi the first robo taxi will be a robo taxi designed car owned by tesla they'll do it they'll test it out mm, they might do it so earlier sure. than you said they might do it earlier than you said because like you said waymo and cruise are already doing it but it's going to be city by city they'll do it okay i'll give you maybe one by the end of this year i just yeah and that's what they'll do. They find the cities that have the best weather, the safest grid type roads like Phoenix or Scottsdale, Arizona, or maybe Vegas, somewhere like that. But it's funny because Alexandra, uh, Kathy Wood is on the exact same page as you and I have a slide on that. She believes robo taxis will be here before year end from Tesla. So what? That, uh, yep. When did she, she said this, huh? She said that uh, Friday. What do you believe, James? I, well, again, they have the technology. Just needs to be tweaked turn off the nag and have it park itself it's there what the not vehicle there. looks like we're not sure uh, i do know i also heard uh i don't know if this is correct or not but giga austin has a whole quarter of the factory dedicated to building the demo line i think you guys know for the model two i've heard that mm -hmm. and these things are going to be spun out every what 15 to 30 seconds so jeff you're the supply chain guru here Theoretically, they could be pumping out hundreds of these a day. And you've seen the production of cyber trucks. Like I watched a video, drone video, and there was one of these things coming out of the factory every 45 seconds. I could not believe it. And I've walked the production line. So James, what do you imagine? Do you imagine this looks like a little bus where people sit in 
you know, round or how, what, what do you imagine? I think we have a good idea what it looks like. Uh, it's right here on this slide. I think you've all no, seen it. No, it's not. That's not what it is, guys. Yeah. James, you believe everything you read? <laughs> but but that was the, that was the wooden thing that there was a picture of Franz von yeah. Holzhausen in front of. Yes. Something like this. It'll be a two-seater. It'll be very small. It'll be very utilitarian, minimalistic. And it doesn't need a lot of bells and whistles. They can stamp these puppies out. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't have to be this aerodynamic anyway, because it'll be in concentrated areas. It won't have to go over 40 miles an hour. So that's, that's my vision. It'll be something boxy. I think it I should be aerodynamic because you want it to last as long as possible before you have to recharge it. I think you, you really yeah. are for efficiency. No. But if you're okay. driving around a city, the aerodynamics doesn't matter that much. It's only when you exactly. go 30 miles an hour. So. Because yeah. you, you think it's only going to be city robo taxis? Initially, that would be the low hanging fruit. I actually think it's going to be mainly airport. I don't know why I have this conviction that it's the main, the, the initial target will be airports, but I could be completely off. Yeah, I don't think the compact platform is going to be ready for production for probably a year or so after the unveil. Um, and I'm not trying to be a party pooper. They would have to, you know, I mean, unless they're just being totally silent on design locking what this is and if they've already done that, um, and I think the other big long tent pole is the manufacturing CapEx design. They're not buying off the shelf robotics. They, uh, they are designing these robotics. They're sending them out. They have, um, you know, their own, you know, division of Tesla, um, that's, that's working on these robotics. They have to send it out for fabrication and then think about it. The robotics themselves, the factory robotics have to be iterated on and prototyped. So they'll do a gen, you know, they'll do a gen one, a gen two, and then they'll get that into product. It's almost like a product itself. The robotics in the factory are a product itself. So those have to iterate a bit. And then when you launch a robo taxi, you really want to get this product to scale. So it gets to the cost structure. You want to get to, to, to break even very quickly. Uh, Cause you don't want to be building 50, $70,000 robo taxis when your target, you know, your target cogs are, you know, $15,000 or, or, or $18,000 to, um, so they really want to get this to scale, uh, pretty quickly. So I think there's a couple of barriers to that, but it, I, I don't know. It doesn't mean that they can't turn on some, some limited form of robo taxi functionality with existing vehicles, but I, I understand why there's a debate on that. Like, will they do that or will they start with a, you know, a purpose built a Tesla design robo taxi to launch the network first? I, I think we can we can debate that, uh, but in terms of this compact platform, I, I, this platform definitely is going to be under development. Doesn't mean that there's not going to be something meaningful to unveil in terms of a prototype on eight eight, but in terms of a, a, a large volume of vehicles that are, you know, that are the actual purpose built robo taxi. I think we're talking, you know, best case the end of the following year. Yeah, I want to add something to that. I think actually we're going to go in three stages. And the one and the first and the second may be simultaneous. The first one is current Tesla owners using their Tesla, bringing them into the network. And again, I think conditions are Tesla insurance and a good safety score. I mean, if you think about it, everything has been prepared for years for this moment. Second group is Tesla's used car inventory. What am I talking about? Remember the Model 3 and the Model Y for a long time and still now cannot purchase back the lease at the end of a lease. They have to bring the car back. At the moment, still Tesla puts these cars back into the open market and sells them. But I think that will stop and they will use that as an initial dedicated Tesla owned fleet. So that is the second group. And like I said, that can be actually simultaneous. If they start building that up from May onwards, they suddenly have thousands and thousands of Tesla old, old three-year-old Model 3s and Model Ys that they can activate at that moment. It's just a software up where, uh, update and off they are. And then the third group is the purpose-built vehicle, Jeff, and you're completely right. That can still take a year or two, whatever time it takes. I want to maintain, and Hybrid, I know you want to talk about design, but I'm just going to rush into that again. I actually think that James's picture of Franz's car is the dream still. I think that's what they're working on. 
but I do believe what's inside of that car and outside will have a lot of components of the Cybertruck. Remember, I, I was talking about last Friday, I was talking about this three weeks ago. I'm just so convinced that the Cybertruck launch was the prototype of everything new. Steer by wire, brake by wire, um, stainless steel, 48 volts, so many things that will all be key to the purpose-built vehicle. And so to get that one right and to get that one right in the masses may take a year or two. I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, putting that into questions, but the first two groups, Tesla's own inventory repurposed as, as robotaxis and Tesla owners used uh, cars that they want to use for robotaxi. I think that is possible by end of year. Well, I very much disagree. I just don't understand why you would start with Tesla owners the risk for the Tesla owners. You don't know the variations of usage. You know, my car is crystal clean. I don't know where Jeff has taken his car in Chicago. Who knows? <laughs> Obviously, he's good. He's good. But it's going to be an Robo Taxi unveil on August 8th. They're going to show you the car, the vehicle. It's not going to look anything like this vision that okay, we saw let's on bet. the book. Let's bet. We, we, let's we will bet. bet. Hold on. It, this is, this is it, 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 you know, I keep telling people, and I, keep, I I feel very strongly that they've, Hans, Franz has been working on this for since 2019. And this design is something he's very proud of. And it's autonomy first. They had to think, just like the way they built the Cybertruck, it was built for, you know, ruggedness first, right? And, and design first. This is going to not look like a car. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be designed for, uh, for if it's autonomy first, right? Like you said, the interior, right? It's not going to be, it's going to be something that you can have more entertainment, more productivity, more relaxation, and the, you can have different configurations inside, but you don't need to have it to look like that. I, I just don't think that a, the, the I don't believe that a, the compact car is just remove the steering wheel and brakes, and then you've got the robo taxi. So first of all, I don't, they're not going to use my car, not going to be my car first. It'll be last. We will be last. And then they're going to do the robo taxi first. And I, I've been saying that it doesn't make sense that they would create a, yet a new ver, a new production line for this, although it's not a production line anymore, it's the unbox. But now that you've got the Model 3, Model Y, then you've got the Cybertruck, now you're going to create yet a brand new one? No. So I agree with you that it's going to be taken a lot from the Cybertruck. I've been saying for a long time that I actually thought it would be stainless steel. People said, well, that's not cheap. That's expensive. Uh, but expensive you know, over how long? If you can use this car a million miles, then stainless steel is the best choice you can have because it may be pay, more expensive yeah. initially, but it doesn't need yeah. any of the other work that you need afterwards, especially and for taxi use. If you're doing robo taxi, I need to feel safe. I'm not going to get into something that's going to kill me. But if I feel like, oh my God, this thing is stainless steel, nothing can damage this thing. Uh, I'm going to feel much more likely so to go. You think it's not going to be a two seater? No. I, so, so, you know, you saw that thing where Elon said good, good, interesting note when somebody said that 85, 90% of all drives are two seaters to one person, by the way, and then the other five, 10% is two people. But if you look at all Ubers, all Ubers are four seater. So I think it's going to be a four seater, but configurable. And so no. you. No. No, let, let, please let's bet. Well, the whole, because the this whole one point, I will win. Please, please, please. The whole point of Unbox, by the way, is that you could make a two seater. You could make a four seater. The only reason I agree with you that it could be two seater is because you want to reduce the cost. And this is going to be minimalistic. It's going to be, you know, it's got to be lower cost. So that's somebody who wants a four seater orders a robo taxi why that is in the neighborhood, right? An owner owned or a Tesla oh, yeah, yeah. owned. Why? Possibly. So it's not as, yeah. No, I think they're going to have a two seater thought. This We've seen job postings. Car. We've Go seen ahead, job yeah. postings. You and you pointed this out. You had a job posting. You pointed out that it says autonomous vehicle platform. So it's not just going to be a two seater. It's not going to be a four seater. It's going to be a van. It's going to be multiple variations of this. But yeah, I'll bet you. There's no way that they're going to book it. You, I'll be the bookie. Yeah, Alexandra's going to put her car you. first. Just, she's going to rent it out first in Robotaxi. No, guys, this is going to be the last thing they do is, oh, by the way, we promised you owners to be able to do this too. No, no, you're wrong. Tesla is, and, and Elon in person, they're so proud of their 
Tesla owners, the ones that bought FSD and the ones that are subscribing to FSD. And actually, so they didn't give they didn't give FSD to the Model X and Model Y like uh, like James until just now. It's been like he's been waiting because decades. It's, it's because the problem is, as you probably know, is that there were different scripts, right? I mean, neural net is going to make this finally harmonious, but at the moment it was like you had to update each version of of whatever. I'm I'm still waiting for mine, but. No, believe me, the <laughs> okay. Tesla owners who want to run will be in the first lot. And what do you guys think? The Jeff Tesla's inventory used cars. I don't want my car in a robo taxi network, but I'm a sample size of one. Um, I'm on your page. <laughs> yeah. Your Cybertruck, maybe, Jeff. I I'm bought my Model you. 3. I'm so, so no. sorry. <laughs> I bought my Model 3 specifically yeah, I I because have. I wanted it in a robo taxi network. I ordered my two Cybertrucks because I want one of them to be a Robotaxi. That was why ago. would you put a Cybertruck to Robotaxi? Can you that's imagine? Like, because that's it is no. stainless. But no, because it's stainless steel. Can you <clears> imagine <throat> running it in Vegas as a as a as a Cybertruck taxi? It's gonna be perfect. All right. Yeah, I I don't know. It, I don't know what I don't know what the I mean. This is ultimately going to be what what Tesla decides they want to do but i i mean i think elon has said it multiple times before that the intrinsic value of the vehicle you know, it's going to change literally overnight when you know when this functionality is available this is we're trying to skate to where the puck is going to be and this is the difficult thing we don't know how we know the puck is moving faster and we know it's moving at a different angle now than it's done before um, so this is what we're all trying to envision. Like, where's the puck going to land and are we skating to it at the right speed and the right velocity? Um, so I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be hard. I don't think there's one answer, um, to these questions. Um, but in terms of the platform, I do think they're doing a platform. I think that's one thing I just, I've seen it debated a lot on, on axes like, oh, they killed this. They didn't now they're building they're building a platform. The whole unboxed manufacturing process yeah. is you're you're changing what a manufacturing line is because right now you've got a in a manufacturing line you've got to kit a certain type of material to a certain bill of material to a serial fixed line, and when you do the unboxed manufacturing process, you're going to take these sections of the car and you're going to make them modular and you're going to build them at different points in time. And you're going to be able to do it in a parallel manner or fashion. And you'll be able to swap out those modules for other modules uh, at some point in time. And the whole idea of this is to make this again, as modular and, and as quick changeover as possible. So you almost change the identification of what a factory is because right now a factory in, in the Tesla factory today, there's a dedicated line for this product line for that product line. And, you know, you've got to, you know, you've got to schedule everything. You've got to run it at certain points in time. And if you're out of material, that line still has all the, so with, with when you can, when you can do this unbox process, number one, you can change the total process time and you have so much more flexibility in terms of planning. Uh, you still have to do all the, you know, the right things from a planning perspective, but, you just have tremendous flexibility. And then uh, a line could, I think I would have to think that the line switch over uh, from one, one type of vehicle in the, in the new platform to another would be very rapid. And I don't think that's the thing that Tesla is talking about publicly a lot yet, but that's a huge kind of like, that's a huge advantage to them in terms of their factory efficiency. Um, Cause if one thing goes down, there's one part, one issue, they can switch over very quickly in that line you know, which is now kind of an unboxed manufacturing process line can switch over to something else pretty quickly. So anyway, got a little bit off track there, but I think it's going to, they're going to have tremendous flexibility uh, with the direction they're going. I, I, I just, you know, I just saw like this new Xiaomi uh, car that's being built. I think it's like 70 seconds, 76 seconds of process time. It just, this thing's, this thing's dead on arrival already. Um, it, again, it may, it may do well. It may sell a few cars this year, but in terms of its longevity versus what Tesla is coming out with, um, you know, look out. So Alexander, you said that it was going to look like, or it's going to share a lot from cyber van. Then if that's the case, it can't look like this. Why not? 
Well, I guess so. I mean, it, this could the, all be glass. If the whitish part, exactly. If the whitish part is uh, stainless silver, if the glass is mm -hmm. what you see, then obviously half of the door you don't see, but that's stainless. No, oh, I think this can be very well stainless. Uh, I, I don't. Uh, no objection to that. And again, let me say that again. I think the first group is Tesla owners. The second group is current used inventory of Teslas, meaning they're not going to put that back onto the market. They're going to accumulate it when they're certain that they'll launch it in a couple of weeks and months. So there'll be thousands of cars ready for that. And then this will come out 2025, 2026. What do I know? You know, what, you I think can't Tesla, buy it anyway. You can't buy this version anyway. Go ahead. Uh, I I agree with Alexander that Tesla is using the 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 Cybertruck platform. That what they launched on the Cybertruck platform was that it is a development vehicle. It is a real vehicle that they wanted to ship and have consumers enjoy. But it was the development platform for their next generation vehicles, and what a perfect vehicle to do it on in terms of volume, in terms of risk. Uh, I know it's obviously it's got wide you know publicity and everybody's looking at every vehicle and yes some of them have had issues, but in general you know they've shipped you know let's call it five thousand they probably put in the service. That's a very small number. They can almost manage it as a fleet. They can see the issues real time. They can correct them really quickly. And there you know if, if you look at the total, let's say there's gonna be seventy million vehicles that are built this year. You know sixty nine point you know, you know, whatever, you know, 69.9, you know, million units are going to be built on the 12 volt architecture. It's got its own supply chain. It's fully ramped all over the world. There's suppliers, there's distributors everywhere in the world, everywhere you need to build a car, it's there. And you have Tesla coming in with this puny volume and, you know, they want to start the 48 volt up. And they're, I think they're doing it in the perfect way. And eventually that they're going to grow that volume over time. They're going to bring more of the supply base into that mix, more of the capacity into that mix. And then eventually as they start getting, you know, more vehicles flipped onto it, you know, it's going to start getting into the millions. And then you're going to have that point where you, it kind of flips over. And it's like, all right, this thing now has the cost structure because it's already more efficient as design versus the 12 volt. And now you're going to get the volume scale weighting of it to flip over and, and in time, you know, for scale for robo taxi. So I do think they're doing that. I do think they want to eliminate things like paint. I think there's been a couple of things that have happened. And I've studied this in, in smart and experienced this in smartphone world as well. And I think they're onto something with Cybertruck. Look at how many different people, have wrapped their cyber trucks. They all look unique. You know, there's every color of the rainbow. There's every, you know, tone, uh, matte, metallic, every type of color. There's multiple colors. There's logos. There's decals. People want to personalize their vehicles they, or they have the opportunity to do it. Guess what's going to happen with that? As the volume of that ramps up, that cost structure is going to come down. So now you're going to have people not only doing it to, to, to take delivery of their vehicle, you're going to have them doing it every year, maybe, and changing, oh, I, want to, I want to change to this, or I want to change to that. They're going to bring the cost structure. They're taking personalization and they're postponing it to the consumer. They're moving it out of the cost structure to actually build the vehicle. They're taking that process time out. They're taking that CapEx out. They're taking that risk out. And in terms of the vehicle, it's going to look newer. It's going to it's going to feel newer and fresher for longer. And that's this is all aligned with where EVs are going: more, more mileage, more usage, and you know, and, and it'll be you know more ruggedized in terms of use. So um, I think this is all this all kind of fits together and all makes sense. Uh, and I do think they're starting with the Cybertruck platform, and they're going to miniaturize it, and they're going to really scale with the Robo Taxi. Uh, there we platform. are. Who told you four weeks ago? Yep. No, yeah. I agree. No, I, we, all of us agree that it's going to be the Cybertruck. It was just funny that we, six months ago, everybody said there's no way that they'll do Cybertruck. Stainless steel is expensive. It's a brand new thing. Well, they're, no, they're going to have to simplify it further, Herbert, to your point. Like, for example, the, the CapEx that, that the, did the first 100,000 Cybertrucks is not going to be like they're going to change that 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 steel that steel processing machine that Schuler machine they'll have they'll probably bring up a new version of that they'll have better better uniformity better process parameters like they're going to continue improving that there'll probably be five generations of that that occur 
And by the time we get the robo taxi, they're going to take the cost structure of that down. They're going to have to, it won't be the same form factor as well. I think, you know, the curves and everything that the angles that are on Cybertruck, it would have to be further simplified for the robo taxi, but it's a platform. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. It's not going to look this car. It may actually look like a, uh, like a boxy thing. It's more about the inside, maximize the inside space for more, you know, more comfort and entertainment productivity. Wow. So you think safety. they're not, you think they're not forward facing, right? And I think actually, I mean, if it could just be me deciding, I would never want to sit sideways or looking back in a car. I, I well, always want to well, sit forward looking. So that means that whole idea of these buses that you see now in, in China, you know, these smaller buses, which have a sort of a U-shaped seat arrangement where you have, you know, and can drive in any direction. I feel very uncomfortable if I'm not forward facing. I think what's going to happen, in, in my guess, and then I'm just totally guessing that uh, you're going to be sitting back like this. Like, first of all, I think it's going to be swivel chairs, and some people are like, "That's dumb." But I think you can. But you're going to be facing. You one person's going to be facing forward, but another person sideways. And because if you're in the center, it's safety. Like they can't afford to have somebody die, and so they're going to use the stainless steel. You're going to have the most safe vehicle ever. They're going to be their robo taxi first until it comes out before they share it with my car, and um, and it's going to be you know the the people will be kind of in the middle of it rather than I'm the outside. That one. But James, we both grew up in Germany, you know, and I don't know you, but I drove in a bus to school, and the bus always had a couple of chairs where you could sit, you know, like in trains Sideways, opposite yes. each other. Never would I sit on those chairs. I would throw up by the time we got to the to, to the school, right? And yeah. and I I just. Don't I think you know there is a logic that in most trains, in most buses, everything is forward looking. No, it'll be it'll be a two seat car and they'll be facing forward. It won't be too radical. People will will be absolutely sick, vomit all over the place if they're facing backwards. And then you have to clean your your sire or your your taxi. <laughs> and that's part of Jeff Lutz's what's the little cottage industry you're thinking up? Maybe you'll have charging stations and then there'll be an adjunct service station to clean and polish and pump up tires, whatever the case may be. Yeah, and, and that's actually another good point because you don't want any fragile material inside. You want stuff where somebody with a hose can just, you know, clean it in a couple of seconds and rather than making it luxuriously difficult to clean. Yeah, yeah I remember that there's a, a train called BART uh, not far yep. from me. They have cloth <laughs> seats. There's nothing more disgusting <laughs> <laughs> like to harbor disease and germs ever. It's like ridiculous. So yeah, it'll be some type of hard material. Um PB it, it's now guys. it's now in the in the in the Cybertruck, right? It's not mm -hmm. a soft material that I've never set no, inside. It, it is all it's, it's all composites. It's like it's yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's a pleather okay. thing. But just like the X. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, where are we, everybody? We're all over the place. It's fun no, to no, it's no, just no. fun to think about what it what this could be. Um and I think I, I think companies are also going to think about just. I think it's. I think I think Herbert's right. I think there's going to. It's going to be. It's going to be radically different for purpose built robo taxis. I think. I think there's experiences and things that you know they're going to want people to to, to experience inside of these things. So, I think it's going to be exciting to just kind of think about what it could be. But I I, I don't think it's going to be too radical in the beginning. But I think it's going to ramp up into into various options and things over time. So. Yeah, the lid. The lid can be anything because the the infrastructure itself will be that giga casting with the battery pack slotted together with the seats on it. The lid they can change. In fact, they may even OEM out the robo taxi to fleet providers or other car companies, and they can yeah. tailor it themselves. You know, have screens for advertising on the inside, etc. The sky is the limit, and they'll they'll have <laughs> the ability to do it all at scale and having and a who platform may be able to compete with them. Who Nobody. could compete? Exactly. Yeah. That's the Manufacturing thing. At scale, the mode yeah, is so big now. Touch us. And, you know, again, I go back to, I walked the Cybertruck line twice. with a We did too, Ford, Jeff, former, remember? Yeah. With a former Ford engineer, okay? He could not believe the fact that every station had a very specific set time. You can see it on a board. You can read the code. It's like it's a 20-second station, a 30-second station, a 15-second station. And then it's all automated. There's no humans. And there's lots of cameras 
for the engineers who monitor what the robots are doing downstairs. He, he was just blown away. He never saw anything like it. And that was geared specifically for production at scale, like we've never seen before. And then you see a picture of General Motors or Ford manufacturing trucks with about eight staff around each station. It's like, this is so far beyond what everybody else is doing is quite incredible. Well, remember, they have union metrics that, it, like, that, that prevent, you know, over automation of things so there's there's i mean there's there's barriers to automation um that are up that there aren't widely talked about and one thing that was super interesting to me is when you look at the components so everything is modular they just slots together but the weight of these components they're too big to even be carried by a human like in other places the humans put the wheels on the car but the cyber truck wheel is too heavy for a human to carry so i think grabs it, throws it on. And I don't know how the bolts are in perfect position every single time, but it's just, it's amazing to see. So I can't even imagine when Elon Musk as well, he's sometimes maybe given a little bit to exaggeration. When he talks about this new production line that's coming, he said it's going to melt yeah. faces. He said I can't remember his exact faces. words, but yep. it's going to be bonkers. And speed, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if they're pumping out a car every 15 seconds on that. Because I know in Shanghai, they are pumping out one every 30 or 40 seconds right now, Model 3, Model Y. Yeah, I think it, well, I think it's publicly somewhere in the 37 to 43 second range. Yeah, so 10, 15 seconds will just be incredible. So when you talk about having 300 cyber or robo taxis on the road, if they, and the speed at which they're scaling the Cybertruck line uh, is shocking everybody. In fact, it wouldn't even be a stretch to say that in Q2 2024, a Cybertruck will be the top selling electric EV truck in the United States. It's going to destroy Ford F-150 Lightning and Rivian and everything else. So I, the scale will be interesting as we... Yeah, and this is one of the things, this is one of the blind spots in the analyst community. They like to count factories and like Tesla needs another gigafactory and they need it. What it's a multivariant problem. Alexander talked about, you know, what's the TAM of vehicles going to do? That's one variable. Uh, what's the output per square meter and their ability to improve that? What James was just talking about. And uh, these these variables exist and they're constantly evolving and changing. And Tesla's learning. They're probably uh, improving these real time. And they're like, wait a minute, maybe I don't need to do there, there, and there. Maybe I just need to do these smaller add-ons in existing, um, you know, in existing giga sites. So I think that's going to be a constantly evolving thing. I don't think you're going to need, you know, as many factories that, that are, you know, that are maybe have needed before, but it's a multivariant problem. It's not just a, if they're not building factories, they're not expanding. It's not that <clears throat> the next each fa each product line is a version of the factory and they're, they're going to be improving that output per square meter pretty dramatically. And in completely fact, agree. It's three ahead. levels. So the, yeah. it's not a linear line. It goes up and down and all over the place to do different things. Yeah, it's it does. Amazing. But I completely agree with you, Jeff. And, I, and, and that's why, honestly, I couldn't care less about current production and delivery numbers or the Q1 results. It just doesn't matter. We're living at the moment something that nobody has ever seen yet. We're shifting the biggest hardware asset anybody has, because I mean, the biggest assets anybody has either a house and then the car, right? We're, we're shifting the, the hardware asset that had traditionally between five and 15% of a margin to a software business. And we're maybe apart from one or two players that are trying to do the same in China. We're the only ones in the world. Tesla is the only ones in the world. So this is humongous because the time changes. I mean, in three years, do you think anybody will purchase a non-full self-driving car anymore when they buy a new car? I mean, first of all, they may not want a new car because they say, why would I need a car? I have robot taxis now all the time conveniently available. And the second thing is, if I want to buy a new car, well, then I may want to buy one that I can actually use as a robot taxi, or at least I want full self-driving on it. And then so who will be there? And and where I was astonished today, I, I didn't have much time. I had a quite heavy day, day job day, but um, Ford obviously announced that they're giving a premium to Tesla sellers who would purchase 
a Ford EV. I mean, Ross Gerber uh, was excited with that one. I just oh, was he? Oh, I'm blocked by him, so I didn't see him. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, but but I mean, obviously, you know, first of all, that shows their desperation. They they need to sell whatever they still have on stock of EVs because every car will look old soon, but the Ford EVs will look even older than anything else. Go ahead. All right. Yeah. So you know. It uh, looks like that Elon's going to finally meet with uh, the Prime Minister, Modi. You know, this was something we thought was going to happen in January. But um, here's Elon posting that he's looking forward to meeting with uh, the Prime Minister soon. Um, the, the one thing I found interesting is this is right after the Q1 earnings day, and India is not just around the corner. So this may be, may be for once an earnings call without Elon. Or maybe he's going to do it from the plane, because if really the timing that was leaked is correct, it's going to be tough for him to be on both first in Austin and then uh, land on time in India. So we'll see whether he will be there. Not can that I think. About that? Can, we, can we talk about this for a minute, Herbert? Just hmm. this earnings uh, this week, this past week with the, the robo taxi announcement, the India announcement, the India trip. And then earnings coming. I mean, what does all this mean? If we, if anybody like sat and thought like through this, I mean, what could they do at earnings? There's even talk at earnings of them taking all this FSD credit and blowing out earnings and having, you know, massively strong earnings, or is it going to be a huge miss? And then there's all these things happening. You know, look, we're launching India or look, we did the, the robo taxi and bail. Like what are, what are people's expectations for earnings? Like, it's the most unpredictable earnings I've ever seen. James. Take a shot. So first of all, uh, they do have a bunch of unrealized revenue as well from mega pack business, warranty business, and FSD business. So they have a treasure trove of cash. Uh, second of all, I did some calculations. If you forecast the mega pack business alone forward three years and assume China's fully ramped, that's a trillion dollar business right there, given growth and margin. It's a trillion dollar business standalone. So forget the other 11 lines of business. The mega back business is huge and nobody talks about it. Nobody, nobody looks to where, as you say, the puck is going to be. Um, and the other item, I don't think Elon wants the price to go up. I think he's happy giving the so-called finger to Wall Street because he needs to renegotiate his comp plan, which Alexandra, you know more about than anybody else. You do not want to renegotiate a comp plan with the stock price at 400, 500 bucks. You want to do it at 175 or 160 or whatever else. He doesn't give a Darn rat's ass, as they say. He wants to keep the price about down, these earnings. Get his comp yeah. package, and then he'll turn on everything. All the absolute crazy, you know, margin to infinity across different lines of business. Imagine making a car for $25,000 that generates $250,000. Uh, okay, I don't, I don't buy this. I don't buy it. He's not like if, if that was all true, then he would not have announced RoboTaxi on 88. Why would you do that? Why would you release FSD? So well, people are going, cause, he's cause purposely he trying to I don't buy it either. I'm with Herbert. Uh, I'm team Herbert. Okay. I'm I'm team paranoid. I'm trying to think <laughs> why, why, why do they have all this un Realized revenue. No, let, let me bring let me bring my conspiracy. Well, just a it. second though. The unrealized revenue, even if they do pull it out for Q1, it's gonna do nothing to the stock, guys, because it's a one-time one thing time. and completely agree. On. completely agree. Completely agree. Completely agree. Not on the energy side, but on the FSD. I mean, that's the bad thing about these reserves, right? When you put them away, they don't help you. When you put them finally in, they say, Oh, it's a one-off. So actually you never get the credit for those. But that's that, that's another subject. What bothers me at the moment is a typical governance issue. Last year we had the shareholder day. I don't remember the date. I think it was 17th of May or something like that. So usually what happens is you can delay it a couple of days, but not weeks. Um, and if you make it much earlier, you need to announce it. They did neither. So it should still be second half of May, right? But usually 40 days prior, you should have the proxy where we are 40 days prior. We are. So, well, we're may maybe 45 days prior now, but in the next couple of days, it should come out. So why is that important? It is because it should have the comp plan, if it is to be voted, it should have in it whether we're leaving Delaware wow. and going to Texas, that should be voted. So the thing is, we have this moment 
of the 23rd. So first of all, this is the first earnings call in a long, long time that's on a Tuesday. They're always on Wednesday. So why is it on a Tuesday? Because probably that India trip was planned for the Wednesday. Okay, so that I can I can take. The second thing is that the 23rd, so it leaves me seven days in, in, um, in, in April, and then the whole month of, of May, that gives me 38 days. So it could still be on the 2nd of June. So the question is, is that proxy going to be out prior or after or on the same day than the earnings call? Because that, that proxy for me is important. It's important in three scenarios. The first scenario is nothing's in it. It's one of the most boring shareholder meetings. There are a couple of uh, nuns who want to know what's happening with cobalt in Africa, but nothing material other than that is going to be in it. No major share because nothing is ready. Very probable because you know the Delaware case is going to go on until July. Then we'll have to have then we'll have to have uh, maybe an appeal or not. The next hearing from Tesla is on first of May, so all this is still far out. And they may still say the lawyers may still say. Don't don't talk about Compackage 2024 until at least the first part of Compackage 2028, uh, 2018 is judged on and then we can file appeal. So the, the, the thing is, this 23rd of April date may be a very, very unfortunate date where Elon can't say much. Just because he, he's having his the situation just so unsure within a couple of days plus having to hop in the in the plane to go to to go to to india so going back to my scenarios first one is the proxy comes out but nothing is in it and we'll have to have a second shareholder meeting probably not in person this year to vote later in the year second half on all the stuff that should be voted now including the the comp package and moving out of delaware second scenario is at least the moving out of delaware part is in this one but again, has to be very, you know, precisely formulated to be able to go through. Or third proxy, well, the comp package is also in there. So those are my three things. It's all going to happen in the next three weeks. Something has to come out in the next three weeks. Plus, in the middle of this all this earnings call, with your right, James, a lot of maybe unrealized stuff that has to come in now, and him jumping into the plane half an hour later, if uh, if that's the plan, if if he's there. I'm, what do you guys think? I mean, do we really think his comp package is going to be set in like this Neanderthal way of like what was the stock price on June fifth, or is it going to be like what what has been the stock price for the last six months on average? I can't uh, I'll imagine that. I agree with you. It's not. Yeah, I can't day. imagine they're going to allow this thing to be gamed of like, oh, what what did it close at on June four? I, 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 I would hope not. And on top of it, it can't be like that because, you know, if you proxy out, it's 40 days, then it's the vote, the, the shareholder vote, the meeting, whatever, and then it's reinstated. So you already buy that half a couple of weeks where, where it all, you know, which stock price should you take? So the easiest thing is that you say, well, we're going to take the average stock price from the last 12 months uh, on the date the proxy comes out or something like that. I do believe they're actively working on it. Also because, you know, with Elon, there are always these little hints. And one hint was that he is now following Era Aaron Price, who is his friend of 20 years. I mean, you're not going to tell me that he didn't follow him before. And then suddenly, a couple of weeks ago, he clicked on follow Era. And everybody was, OK, we've got our hey, comp plan rules. A, a he never question, tweets anything either. But yeah, it's interesting. No, that, I did see that too. Yeah. A, a question for the audience. So, Alexander, you're following this very carefully. Do you think? They're just going to do away with that Delaware settlement, pay off the legal firm with whatever they want, the three six. law firms that wanted the money, six firms, my God, and six then billion. just reinst six. Oh, it's already been settled at six million. No, 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 no. Let me tell you where we are. I love this subject. Thank you, James. Okay. Thank you, James. Sorry about, sorry about Herbert and Jeff who listen to this already two or three times. <laughs> so where we are at the moment is the judge brought out her ruling saying she doesn't think Elon deserves that. And because of form errors, because they didn't say that Kimball is his brother and Ira is his friend of 20 years and whatever, this should be cancelled, but cancelled with the opportunity to reinstate if cleared up. Okay, so it's not cancelled like it can never happen. Um, but that obviously, so the, the argument is by cancelling it, it saves Tesla 
60 billion dollars was actually more was it 250 billion whatever i don't remember it was a huge amount of money but i think it was 250 billion. so it saves tesla money because they don't have to honor those options that were going out until 2028 and have been written since 2018. um so so she said the outcome but she didn't statue on how much the plaintiff's attorney should be paid so for that she, she left it open and said i'm going to hear now from the parties how much they think the, the plaintiff's attorney should be so i'm not ruling this final until i have that information so a couple of days a couple of short weeks ago um plaintiff's attorneys came in and said okay we want 29 million shares we want to be paid in shares because that's that's not going to devastate tesla thank you uh and and we want to shares because we want to have you know be in the game i mean th that's the most ridiculous but never mind um so 29 million shares that day came out to be more than six billion dollars now what happens in the future first of may tesla has the hearing to say how much they think plaintiff's attorney should be paid Okay, so that's coming up in, in two and a half weeks. Then 31st of May, plaintiff's attorney can react to that and bring forward now, you know, his second thoughts on all that. Six or seven days later, both Tesla's and plaintiff's attorney could have reached a settlement and have to bring that forward. So that is on, I think, June 6th or 7th or something, if I recall it right. And then one month later, July 8th, is a final hearing and she she pronounces the judgment and then if that happens then within 30 days tesla can appeal or not so what do i think happens if that judgment because i mean the most ridiculous is she thinks elon shouldn't be paid that much the most ridiculous would be that she would think that attorneys should be paid that much right i mean the, the, the that just, you know, doesn't make any sense. I mean, we'll hear what Tesla has to say as an argument, but that would be my main argument. You can't deny to somebody what he should be paid and then give a huge amount to somebody else to be paid. Um, but let's say this judgment is actually reasonable. Let's say she would finally give them 20, 30 million and not 6 billion. Then probably Tesla would be wise not to appeal just for the sake of ending this horrible story, get out of Delaware, set up a new comp plan, reinstate the 2018 comp plan by telling us, you know, how many times they had dinner together, and then we're all good. Um, but if that judgment is 6 billion, that it is not going to be what we call executory, meaning they, they don't have to pay those and issue those shares straight away if they go into appeal, then I think it has, there's a good reason for, for Tesla to appeal if the amount is outrageous and go into appeal, not issue the shares and, um, and um, see. And the appeal takes about a year to 14 months. No. Six billion buys a lot of H100s. It does, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is the new currency of the world today. It is. So good. All right. Thanks for going through that. Yeah. It was fantastic. Really so I just want to ask that question about Ira. So Ira is in charge of the compensation plan. He's part of the board. For he, for Elon to follow him, it's the opposite, right? Because the whole thing about the judge was, oh, you're too connected to the board. So now you're even following each other in X, which is dumb. But what is you're saying? What is it? What, what are you saying that that's? I just think it was a little hint saying, you know, this is done now. We can follow each other again. I think this is Easter egg. sort of oh. the yeah. Oh. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, wonderful. So, whoa, we covered quite a bit. We talked about robotaxi valuation, the robotaxi design. No, I, I'm not going to bet. <laughs> you win. Uh, the Q1 earnings, we talked about Giga India. Thank you so much, James. I really appreciated you joining us today. Just, I've totally. uh, been here. Thank you both. Love it. Come back anytime, oh, James. <laughs> Please. Once a month, you promised, hopefully. Once a month. Okay. Yes. If you can. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Truly my pleasure. I love, I love being here and learn so much from you all as well. It's a great place to share. Thank you, Herbert, for organizing. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. Great to see you again. And Jeff. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you. Bye -bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.